Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. And uh, thank you all for your interest in mushrooms and fungi. So uh, uh, I'm here on behalf of Fungi Perfecti. And, uh, and basically, you know, mushrooms have been a huge influence on me since I was very young. Uh, I went picking uh, edible mushrooms as a kid up near Baker Lake and just have always been infatuated with these uh, underrepresented and underappreciated organisms. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is some fascinating features of these wonderful fungi and the mushrooms that we see and how they really are environmental stewards as our climate changes. Uh, they're foundational organisms, they benefit people, they benefit the planet, and it's, I think it's just really important that people understand their place uh, in the world. So uh, if anybody has any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to raise your hand. But we are going to have kind of a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to hang on to your questions, and we can address them later as well, uh, whatever you'd like. So without further ado, I'm going to get started. So what are these things anyhow? Well, you know, when you're walking around in the woods and taking a hike, you know, a lot of times you notice the trees, and you notice the plants, or maybe the birds, if you're into that. Um, but there are also these brightly colored objects scattered in the forest floor. And in this case, uh, we've got a lobster mushroom. But they really do look pretty weird. And so a lot of people are kind of uh, fungophobes. They're afraid of them. They're unfamiliar. And um, so I think it's really important that people become more familiar with mushrooms and the fungi that create them. So mushrooms come from spores. They are basically the fertile structure of a fungus. And like the apple on the apple tree is intended to produce seeds, uh, mushrooms produce spores. So here we have a ornamented spore and then some smooth spores. And there we have one that's germinating and beginning to grow. Now when a spore is released from a mushroom and it lands in the right place, it will germinate and form a hypha. And uh, when the hyphae grows and sort of branches, it turns into what we call mycelium. So uh, here's another picture of spores. They grow on these little structures called basidia, and those line the gills of the mushrooms or pores of polypores, etc. cetera. Um, so here we have a Ganoderma, and this is the spore mass. So even though spores are microscopic, uh, in mass, they take on a color, um, and they can form in such large numbers that they actually accumulate on surfaces as a dust or a powder. Uh, in this case, we have an oyster mushroom patch that was ignored, uh, completely covered the surrounding area and the white spore deposit. So again, these spores germinate. They form what we call mycelium. Now, mycelium is the vegetative state of any fungus, be it mold. Uh, even certain yeasts can form mycelia. Um, and mushrooms uh, usually form on vast masses of mycelia that grow underneath the ground that you can't see. So it's this kind of a network of uh, interconnecting tubes. And these tubes are hollow. They're uh, just one cell wall thick. And they basically run throughout the environment, absorbing nutrition and increasing their biomass until they have enough nutrients to form a mushroom. So here we have a picture of Neurospora, which is a mold. But it's really easy to grow. And it's commonly studied because of the, the mating characteristics. It's really easy to kind of learn about fungi in general using Neurospora. But one thing that you see here, they stained the nuclei green. And the nuclei can actually move between cells. So unlike animals, where one cell has one nucleus and a set of organelles, um, the fungal cell walls uh, actually have septa, or little kind of pores in between them. And so the fungi can have multinucleate cells, and in some cases, many nuclei in one cell. Oftentimes, there are more nuclei at the tip of the fungus, because that's where it's growing and interacting with the environment. And then further down the tube, there might be cells that have zero nuclei in them. So you know they really are quite a bit different than other organisms. So this mycelium is typically white, although it can be other colors, yellow, uh, sometimes brown, or even black. But white is kind of the classic mycelial form that you'll see when you turn over a log or lift up a rock in the woods. Um, and you know it's basically channeling nutrients back to the, to the main uh, body of the fungus. So there are a couple of different life cycles I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is a cup fungus, and then the puff ball, one of my favorites. Uh, when, you know, when you poke it, it poofs out. Those are the spores. Um, but these are what we call basidiomycetes um, and ascomycetes. There are two different main classes. So 
Um, your classic example of an ascomycete is a morel. And this is what we call an ascus. Um, ascus means sac. And so you can see there the spores are contained in this uh, little sac, and that's where they mature. And the life cycle uh, shows that you know, the spores germinate, they grow, and then when the mushroom is maturing, it forms these little sacs. And then when the, when the, the spores are ripe inside that sac, the, t the tip of it kind of pops off, and the spores are ejected uh, into the air. Basidiomycetes are different. Basidia means pedestal. Um, and so that's like your classic gilled mushroom. And so on each gill, there are these cells called basidia. And that's where the sort of genetic differentiation, the uh, mitosis and meiosis occurs, and the, basically the, the children's spores are produced. Um, and they mature on the tips of the basidia and are released, and they typically fall downward um, out of the gills of the fungus. So the, the mushroom form is kind of like an umbrella used to protect the maturing spores. So again, the life cycle here, these spores germinate, they form mycelium, which amasses nutrients and eventually forms a mushroom. Now, uh, fungi live in many different environments, but here in our forests and um, in other ecosystems as well, they perform foundational roles um, and so I'm going to discuss some of those roles right now. Um, first and foremost, there are the decomposers. So like oyster mushrooms or the polypores that you see are kind of the major nutrient recyclers of the forest. You know, when a tree dies and falls, its life is not complete. Um, you know, rotting logs are basically legacies of the forest. A cedar tree or a, an old growth fir can decompose for a thousand years after it has grown for four or five hundred. So, you know, a dying tree is basically the source of food and nutrition for the next generation of plants. But those plants wouldn't be able to access this nutrition without the fungi. So the decomposers land on these logs, they begin to break them down. You know, in this example, it was probably significantly broken down as a standing snag and eventually fell. But again, these fungi are nature's recyclers, and without them, we wouldn't have the plants of the forests that we see today. So they also are symbionts with trees in a different sense. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi, myco means fungus, rhiza means root. So this fungus root symbiosis is fascinating. And many, many plants, over 90% of plant families form mycorrhiza. Um, although some plants can grow without them, uh, they don't grow as well. And so the fungus actually grows into the root and extends the network of the root system. So you can see here, this is a seedling that has you know, a few small roots. It's grown in a little ant farm style terrarium. Um, but then they inoculated it with a mycorrhizal fungus. And you can see the mycorrhizae growing out into the soil. And so it significantly extends the root system of the plant, increasing nutrient uptake. And because it's symbiotic, it wants the plant to be healthy and happy, so it can help with disease resistance. Pathogens such as nematodes won't penetrate a fungal-infused root as easily. Um, and so there are a plethora of benefits. Um, and because the plants are producing sugars, they send those sugars down to the roots, and the fungi take sugars in exchange for nitrogen, phosphorus, and other micronutrients that the plant needs to grow. And this is one of my favorites, a little calypso orchid that relies on mycorrhiza to grow. So here are a few mushrooms as well that are mycorrhizal. The candy cap smells like maple syrup um, and arushula that's kind of rare. And actually, you see there the rattlesnake plantain. That's another Pacific Northwest orchid that relies on mycorrhizae. So fungi are not all good, necessarily. Um, although pathogens and parasites have their roles in nature and disturbances necessary for any healthy ecosystem, uh, certain fungi are extremely pathogenic. So you can see these stretches of forest that are kind of diseased looking where there aren't as many healthy trees. Uh, those are infected with R. malaria, which is also known as a honey mushroom or the bootlace fungus. And they produce these huge black rhizomorphs. They can actually girdle trees and uh, cause premature tree death. Um, but again, they're kind of creating these clearings in the forest. And overall, it helps balance the ecosystem. Um, of course, there are entomopathogenic fungi as well, fungi that grow on insects. Typically, they're molds, and they don't necessarily form mushrooms. But in this case, we have cordyceps, 
growing on a ghost moth larva and here on a leaf cutter ant. So cordyceps is a mushroom forming fungus that grows on insects and they're Every single species of cordyceps is specific to a species of insect. So they're pretty particular um, for their hosts. And then of course there's Ganoderma and it's a problem in citrus orchards and, and other uh, tree rotting fungi that can be detrimental um, to the health of a lot of times managed kind of orchards is more of a problem than out in the forest. But you know, you'll see trees that are kind of unhealthy and sickly and infected with these fungi as well. Now, some mushrooms have multiple ecological roles and we just aren't really sure where they fit in. So like the morel uh, can be found in places where there aren't any trees around, but it's also commonly associated with certain trees. So it's been um, thought to be what they call a faculative mycorrhizal fungus. So it can grow without it, but it can also grow with the tree roots and associate with it as well. Um, same thing, this is a honey mushroom and the reason why I include that is because sure it's a pathogen and a parasite on living trees, but when the tree dies it actually turns around and decomposes it as a saprotroph. So it has those two different ecological roles. So here we all are inhabiting this planet Earth um, and at Fungi Perfecti we like to call it a mycelial earth because mycelium infuses nearly every ecosystem on the planet even though you can't see it. You know again back to the forest a lot of people walk around and they are awed by the trees and they're awed by the wildlife but a lot of them don't appreciate the fungi and if you start to look around you'll see mushrooms and fungi everywhere. Uh, up on the trees, even leaves when the big leaf maples fall those spots are all fungi on the leaves. It's really fascinating. Um, so here we have a diagram of the forest and it's kind of a cutaway and you can see that that rich layer of decomposing organic material is infused with the mycelium of these decomposers and mycorrhizae and they're all kind of interacting and connecting plants. Um, some work by Suzanne Simard out of the University of British Columbia. I believe it was in the 90s but uh, she published an article called The Wood Wide Web and it actually showed that one tree can have 15 or 20 or even 100 different species of fungi on it. And if you map the tree root systems and then you map the fungal root systems, they overlap. So you could have two trees connected with one fungal partner and then another fungal partner connects it to the next tree over. Um, and so up until that point, they actually thought of all these plants as being in competition with one another. You know, one tree kind of battling with the one next to it for nutrients. Whereas the fungi actually connect them all and they've discovered that carbon from the trees, the, the large you know, old growth trees growing overhead will actually work its way down into the roots and it'll help out young you know, nurse or seedlings on a nurse log that don't have access to the sunlight. So this kind of was an eye opener for uh, ecologists that really the forest is kind of just one big system working together to grow and there isn't as much competition as one would think. So here we have a, a really close up look at mycelium and you can kind of tell you know there's not really one way to travel. Um, it's a network of cells that are all interconnected and so it's really efficient at moving water and nutrients uh, throughout the ecosystem. Um, now fungi are different from plants and many animals in that their cell walls are made of chitin. Uh, you know, plant cell walls are made of cellulose and lignin. Well, chitin is actually the same material that makes up uh, insect exoskeletons and crustacean shells. So it's really tough stuff. And you see here there's this little bit of mycelium holding up all of these wood chips and it's actually been shown that one hyphae can hold over 15,000 times its mass. So they help secure and stabilize the soil and prevent erosion as well. They're not just growing in there, they're helping stabilize the forest and um, again really helping keep that soil in place. And as they grow they sequester carbon and that was another recent discovery you know in the last 20 or 30 years um, is that most of the carbon, over 30 percent of the carbon it, that's tied up in the forest is actually in the soil in the form of glomalin which is a kind of a mucus that these fungi give off as they grow. And they had never looked at the soil. They were measuring trees, they were measuring you know other places where carbon could be stored and they didn't think of the fungi underground. So really that carbon sequestration is an excellent role that fungi play and contribute to the forest. So again with the mycorrhizae this kind of shows how um, 
you know, this seedling was inoculated, placed in sterile soil, so that's the only fungi there. And then two seedlings of a different species of pine were planted that didn't have any mycorrhizae on them, and they connected right into the network. Um, and so they're all kind of sharing that mycelial network and exchanging nutrients. Uh, here we have a, a tree grown in sterile soil and a tree grown with mycorrhizal fungi present. So it shows you the difference in growth. It was a controlled experiment. Um, so, you know, again, fungi inhabit many different ecosystems and um, the forests would not be as big as they are today without fungi. Um, back when most organisms were basically in the uh, seas and there wasn't much growing on the land, there were fungi on the land and there's this uh, period of time where they called the greening of the earth where plants, algae kind of began to colonize the land and there were bryophytes and non-vascular plants but uh, the fungi enabled vascular plants to begin to grow up instead of just colonizing the, the floor. And so these fungi allowed vascular plants to evolve and become the massive trees and other plants that they are today. Uh, fungi also live underwater. So in ocean sediments, and in this case, Sathrilla aquatica grows in kind of river bottoms. Uh, so, you know, mush mushrooms can be found in many different places where you would never expect them. And this was an accidental find. Uh, some fish biologists down in Oregon were doing a study and one of them just looked down and there were mushrooms underwater and no one had seen them there before. So, um, who knows, they're probably growing on decomposing organic material in the, in the sediments there. But uh, no problem, just form in a mushroom and the spores float downstream and continue to grow that way. Um, now mushrooms actually are bioluminescent, not all of them, but many different species. And I was talking about the honey mushroom, our malaria, and it actually forms what we call foxfire. And so if you're out in the woods late at night, um, it's this phenomenon where if it's completely dark, certain pieces of rotting wood will actually illuminate. And it's kind of this eerie blue green glow. It's not as extreme as this. This is a tropical species that we cultivated. Um, but that picture is not photoshopped or anything. That's literally the glowing mycelium. And there are many different species that bioluminesce. And we're not really sure why. Uh, there's actually an article on our website that goes throughout the or goes over the chemistry of it if you're interested. Um, there's some really cool enzymes that many different fungi possess, and then certain fungi are able to harness those enzymes and bioluminesce as necessary. And we're not sure why, but it's certainly pretty cool. So why would you want to grow mushrooms or be into them? Well, you know, they're an excellent food source, right? People have been eating mushrooms for you know, centuries if not longer, and uh, they've got many health benefits as well. Um, as decomposers, they can be helpful in your yard, in your garden, or in the forest. Um, I'm going to talk about mycoremediation as well, uh, using fungi to help clean up ecosystems and promote and restore the environment. There are interplanting benefits in the garden as well, since they're you know, breaking down material and recycling nutrients and uh, supporting biodiversity. Um, they've found that in old growth forests, they're very fungal dominant. And as the number of fungal species go up, the number of other species increase as well. So there's a correlation there. Uh, with biodiversity, and of course to have fungi. So in terms of the health benefits, mushrooms are considered a superfood. They're really, really good for us, and um, they can actually help balance and modulate the immune system and support your microbiome. So there are many reasons to consume fungi on a regular basis. As a vegetarian protein source, they're very, very use a useful alternative for people trying to avoid meat. Um, and I, I like to show this slide because um, humans and fungi shared a common ancestor about 500 million years ago. And sure, it was just a single-celled organism, but that was long after plants diverged. So we're actually more closely related. All animals are more closely related to fungi than plants. So this is the basics of growing mushrooms. And whether you start with spores or a piece of mushroom tissue, the idea is you sterilize a substrate, inoculate it, so you impregnate it with the fungus, and expand it until it's got enough food to produce mushrooms. It's pretty simple. Um, you can start with spores by taking a spore print, 
And so spores coming off the gills, as long as you leave it undisturbed, so put a bowl over it so the wind currents don't um, disrupt the spores, they'll fall straight down onto a piece of paper. And mycologists use this for identification because spore color is really significant. Uh, you know, mushroom spores can be green, they can be yellow, they can be purple, uh, they can be white. And so it's a really easy place to start if you're trying to identify a mushroom. Um, but of course, there are also the, you know, little packets of DNA that are ready to give rise to the next generation of mushrooms. So you can use those to produce more mushrooms. So again, you kind of collect the uh, cap, you cut the stem off, put it on a piece of paper, and in this case, if you've got a white spored mushroom, you don't want to use a white piece of paper. So they actually make um, spore printing pages that are half black, and you can set it in the middle to try and see what color it is a little bit better. Um, but once you have your spores, you know, we grow in a lab, and so we have a sterile lab, um, micron filters that basically filter out all the mold and contaminants in the air, and we grow it on agar. It's a simple mixture of agar with a malt extract or some other sugar, maybe potato. Um, so you pour the agar plates and streak your spores on them, and sure enough, a few days in, the spores have germinated, and, you know, two spores of different mating types have to combine. You know, spores are haploid. They only have half of the genetic information of the parent. So two spores of the right mating types have to find one another. And they do what we call anastomosis. And so the tubes connect and they fuse and then they exchange genetic material. And from that point on, the organism is diploid. And so it has genetic material from both parents and it can then reproduce. So that happens, you know, on a microscopic scale. And here we have many, many different individuals that have underwent that recombination and, and basically it results in a flurry of growth. Um, and once it grows out like that, you can see they're kind of differentiating and you'd want to choose a section and transfer it to a new petri dish. And as the mycelium sectors like that, you want to select certain sectors that uh, would promote mushroom formation. So these kind of rhizomorphic root-like growths are a sign that that's a vigorous culture. Um, and here we have, you know, a couple of different sectors taken off a petri dish. And basically you take those little bits and you put them in sterilized grain. And the grain uh, gets filled with the mycelium and then you can expand it 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. Uh, we found that a piece of mycelium taken from a mushroom that's the size of your pinky can grow a thousand pounds, or excuse me, a million pounds of mushrooms in about six months if you expand it to its maximum potential. So one mushroom taken from the forest, if you take it into culture, you could grow mushrooms for years and just put you know, clones in the fridge and keep growing them. It's really, really fascinating, the growth potential of these organisms. And they grow really fast. So this is kind of like day one, three, five, seven, um, you know, so you can actually watch them grow. If you leave and come back to your culture four hours later, sometimes if you put a little line on it, you can observe the mycelium growing, especially if it's very vigorous and young. Now, once it's uh, grown and, you know, absorbed enough nutrition to produce a mushroom, that, um, that little kind of primordia, I guess, um, erupts very, very quickly and the mushrooms form before you even know it. So here's maybe a day later as it lifts up out of the mycelium. Um, and here we have an oyster mushroom patch, you know, day one we'll call it, um, three, five, and they're ready to harvest. So, you know, after growing for 20 to 30 days, the mushrooms form in a week and you can pick them and eat them or clone them and produce more mycelium. So if you're growing mushrooms, you can either set up a terrestrial mushroom patch, you can grow them on straw bales or on logs. Um, totems are a great way. If you have a lot of spawn, you can just spread it in between these stacks. Or you can get creative. Uh, this artist in France inoculated a ch chair. He stuffed it with straw and inoculated it with three or four types of oyster mushrooms, and it was a living art exhibit. And he just let them fruit over time as people came by and, and observed the mushrooms. So the other thing, if you have mushrooms, an easy way to do it at home without all the fancy lab equipment and stuff like that is to use the stem bud. Uh, 
It doesn't work with all species, but species like Strafaria or the oyster mushroom decomposers that are pretty aggressive, um, you can take the base of the stem, cut it off, and place it on cardboard. Cardboard's kind of a selective substrate. You know, it's, it's based on wood, so it's got the right nutrient composition for fungi, but it doesn't really grow molds too well. So you soak cardboard, you put uh, the stem butts on it, and they immediately be begin to grow out. And you see that mycelium growing, then you can overlay it with wood chips or straw and, and use that as your kind of your culture, your spawn. Of course, if you do have a mushroom patch, you could just mine some mycelium and use it to start another patch. And we use burlap sacks a lot of times when we're implanting mycelium outdoors, excuse me, because it's permeable, it allows the mycelium to interact with the environment, and the mushrooms can form on the outside of the burlap. And there you see burlap actually can be colonized and consumed as well, so it will eventually completely deteriorate. And so those myco bags is something we use in our mycoremediation as well. So this is kind of a pictorial overview of mycoremediation, which is basically implanting fungi in the environment to jumpstart ecological recovery. And you see there's cardboard spawn, plug spawn from the stem butt, or burlap rolls with the stem butts in them. So fungi as decomposers are really excellent at generating soil. You can take woody material or agricultural waste products, spread them out, put the spawn in there, and they'll create wonderful soil for your garden. So here we have alder, wood chips, and sawdust. There we have it fully colonized with the mushroom mycelium. And then a year or two later, when it's completely turned into rich soil. Now, worms really like mycelium too. We did this test where we did a control with uh, oyster spawn, just sterilized sawdust, chips, and then chips with strafaria in it. And we put a bunch of worms in the box and bam, most of them went straight to the mushroom spawn. So uh, I know people who've done like aeroponics and other experiments with a mushroom component, they'll find the worms go up into their mycelium. And so vermicomposting as well, if you do it indoors for your food scraps and whatnot, you can mix in some newspaper and inoculate with oyster mushrooms and you get the mushroom component and the worms and everything. So they're very complementary. Now these are our compost piles at work and so these are spent mushroom kits and then of course a year later. So again, they're very, very good at generating rich, nutritious soil. If you're a gardener, you can actually inoculate your garden with mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and so, you know, these are some controls where they grew with and without. Uh, the mycorrhizal fungi, same thing there. Uh, you know, plants just tend to grow a lot better with it. Now, if you have a natural yard with a lot of trees overhead and it's pretty undisturbed, you've probably got native fungi in there already and you don't have to worry about it. But if you're setting up a new garden bed or you're planting plants in potting soil, potting soil is oftentimes sterilized. And so it's really useful to add the mycorrhizal fungi back so those natural fungal partners can benefit your plants. There we have a picture of just mycelium growing on roots. So they really don't harm the plants much. It's mostly all beneficial. So mycorestoration. Uh, this is a quote from Paul. I'm just going to read it to you real quick. Habitats like people have immune systems which become weakened over time due to stress, disease, or exhaustion. So mycorestoration is the use of fungi to repair or restore the weakened immune systems of environments. I think that's a great way of thinking about it. So there are a couple of different components of microrestoration. Um, that mycelium with the filter um, picture earlier, you know, basically is a biological filter. It's very, very effective at removing contaminants of bacteria such as E. coli and, and other undesirable microorganisms. Uh, mycoforestry is basically considering the fungi and not just using, you know, conventional slash and burn techniques. Um, you know, letting all of the materials decompose in place, um, encouraging mycorrhizal fungi when you plant out your tree stock, and just, you know, really just looking at the ecosystem as a whole in forestry as opposed to just trees growing and that's it, nothing else. Um, Microremediation is looking at actually how these organisms can denature or detoxify certain persistent organic pollutants. Um, because of the powerful enzymes that they use to break down lignin and cellulose, they can actually mineralize or reduce to carbon dioxide persistent organic pollutants that many other organisms can't. Uh, and then, of course, mycopesticides. It's the use of these entomopathogenic fungi 
to selectively control certain insect populations. So again, microfiltration um, using fungal mycelium as a biological filter. It looks a lot like a filter, right? Uh, this mycelium is actually sterile, uh, and so you're not seeing any bacteria or anything else in there. It's just the fungal mycelium. But if you were to observe mycelium out in the environment, you know, it's interacting with many different organisms, bacteria and, and yeast and other fungi, and, and so it naturally has to kind of combat the pathogens, right, um, and, and promote the good guys. And so uh, we've actually found that with using mycelium, um, see here's a picture of the exudates, so it's releasing these enzymes into the environment and reabsorbing it. Um, you know, that's another fascinating, unique feature about fungi is they digest, basically they have their stomachs on the outsides of their bodies. So whereas we have to ingest our food and then the waste goes out the other end, fungi release the enzymes into the environment and then they selectively absorb what's broken down. So it's a totally different way of going about uh, digestion and nutrient acquisition. But again, because they release these enzymes, the enzymes can act on these uh, pathogenic organisms or toxins and um, and then the fungi selectively absorb what they want and everything else kind of goes on down the line so this is a chart of mushrooms versus microbes and if you're interested in all these different uh, species of fungi and what microorganisms they're active against you can look it up in mycelium running you could probably also find this online but many of the fungi that we grow um, and edible mushrooms as well, such as the pearl oyster or the strafaria, the garden giant, are active against uh, undesirable microbes. And so you'll see E. coli up there. Many different fungi can um, neutralize E. coli bacteria, which is a pretty big problem here in the Puget Sound and, uh, and other bodies of water as well. Um, but the responsible use of these fungi to intercept runoff in particular areas of concern can reduce that kind of burden on the ecosystem. So here we have fecal coliform levels in a, a, one of our tests on the Olympic Peninsula before, so kind of upstream of the mycobags. And then downstream, you'll see a lot of the numbers are significantly reduced, 240 to 30, 170 to 40. Um, and so, you know, it's, we've actually done a couple of follow-up tests where we ran, we spiked um, water with E. coli and ran it through buckets of mycelium, and the water came out clean. So the mycelium was actually able to absorb and or neutralize the bacteria. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you could implant these into the environment, um, and usually it's in the form of a bioswale. Bioswale is a pretty common way to get water to kind of move slowly and um, infiltrate and, and be sort of cleaned as it goes. Um, but if you put these myco bags in strategic locations in the bioswale, you can use the fungal mycelium as well to help clean up the water. And we call that bunker spawn because you kind of pile it up like a bunker. So again, using burlap sacks allows the water to permeate into the mycelium and uh, allows the mycelium to act in cleaning the water. So you can dig trenches, like if this is a you know, horse pasture and the, the runoff is kind of over a large area, you can just kind of put it right along the stream um, or in, you know, along roadsides and ditches, etc. So there are many different places where you can implant mycelium um, at the point source, so to speak. And this is an example of a storm event where we probably should have put another row in or something like that. So, you know, logistics and um, basically considering the worst case scenario of each site is a really important aspect of this in order to, you know, create a successful microfiltration system. And of course, rain gardens. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but many people have rain gardens to kind of treat water on site instead of, you know, if you live in the city, instead of just pumping it down into the sewers and out into the sound. You can actually disconnect your downspouts and create a little garden in the back. And not only is it pretty, but it treats your stormwater on site. And so you can use plants and you can incorporate the mulch layer. Um, you can incorporate fungi such as the garden giant into it. And it'll not only prevent erosion of your mulch, um, it'll help with the water infiltration and provide that mycofiltration component as well. So hydrocarbons, these uh, persistent organic pollutants that we 
have to deal with because we use so much petroleum on a daily basis. Um, hydrocarbons are everywhere in the environment now, and many of them are extremely toxic, and they don't break down readily. Um, you know, oil, gasoline, uh, tar, creosote, things like that um, have many persistent organic pollutants that are harmful to you know aquatic life and um, terrestrial life as well. And so we actually have found that certain fungi, these enzymes that they release, can actually break down these hydrocarbons into lesser or even non-toxic components. Um, so you know there are many different persistent organic pollutants and many different fungi. And so you know you would ideally choose a species that has some research indicating it'll break down that toxin. Um, but if you look at the pearl oyster, Pleurotus ostriatus, it's active against many different persistent organic pollutants. And uh, so we actually experimented with the oyster mushroom and various forms of oil um, to see how it would kind of break it down and, and remediate. And so in this case, we took some mycelium and we poured some gearbox oil on it, pretty nasty stuff. And the mushrooms fruited amazingly, and they did really well. And when we analyzed them, they were actually free of any petroleum contaminants. So it was able to grow in the presence of it, break it down, and yet the fruit bodies didn't contain the toxins. So it's really kind of cool that they were able to deconstruct it and reconstruct it into nutrition. Now the mycelium is also really absorbent. So we've experimented with things like mycobooms, floating uh, logs of mycelium that can kind of contain areas where there's oil on the water. And, uh, and here you have a picture of the, you know, the oil, and then the next day it's absorbed a significant amount more. So they do soak it up and you know, break it down and, and cleanse the toxins. And of course, produce wonderful edible mushrooms. Uh, you know, we don't really recommend eating mushrooms if you're performing remediation, but you could always dispose of them knowing that they aren't toxic, or you could analyze them and make the decision for yourself. Um, so we actually did some work with the, up here in Bellingham, actually, the Department of Transportation had an old lot that they needed to remediate, and they wanted to try out different remediation strategies, bioremediation. And so they looked at um, infusing the pile with nitrogen, right, to promote bacteria. Uh, they actually looked at inoculating it with certain types of bacteria. And then, of course, they compared fungal bioremediation. So here we have sawdust, and then the sawdust spawn with the pearl oyster mushroom in it. And they're mixing it in with this diesel contaminated soil. And I believe the levels were 20,000 parts per million, which is 2%, so pretty contaminated. Um, sure enough, after about six weeks or so, the Mushrooms were fruiting, the pile was already getting lighter in color, and it was just, you know, this happy, healthy mushroom patch. And the mushrooms were gigantic, bigger than we see in most cultivation situations. So, you know, they were really feeding on that oil. And of course, after the mushrooms kind of, you know, went away, mushrooms actually, um, I don't know if any of you mushroom pickers have found worm-ridden mushrooms that are a little bit too old. But um, an important part of the mushroom life cycle is providing a home for insect larvae. So the flies will come along, lay their eggs at the base of the mushroom, and the larvae grow in the mushrooms. Well, of course, those larvae and the flies that you know, the larvae turn into attract birds. Birds drop seeds, and the seeds you know, sprout, germinate into plants. And so here we have this oasis of life being born from a pile of contaminated toxic soil. Uh, literally less than a couple months later. It might have been six or eight weeks at that point. Um, so it was pretty awesome. And the other forms of remediation they were using were not nearly as quick. Um, so the fungi kind of won in that case. Now fungi also accumulate heavy metals. And we haven't done a lot of work with this um, because it, you know, heavy metals are pretty difficult to deal with because they're you know, individual ions. You can't just break them down, right? All you can really do is move them around and reduce concentrations. And, and that's really the goal, is to reduce the concentration below the toxicity threshold. But uh, again, certain fungi will hyperaccumulate uh, heavy metals, in some cases, thousands of times over whatever's in the environment. And so you could theoretically grow those mushrooms in a contaminated area. And the mycelium will hyperaccumulate the heavy metals in the fruit bodies, which you can then remove of and dispose of, which is 
a lot less expensive than having to dispose of all the soil to begin with. So there's a lot of potential there, but you know, it's not really a best management practice and hasn't really been explored too thoroughly. Um, but we do feel there's a lot of potential there for research and, and you know, you could use these fungi in certain instances to clean up uh, mine sites or, um, or other places where heavy metal contamination is concerned. Now, mycopesticides, so again, these entomopathogenic fungi, right, that naturally their life cycle consists of spores landing on an insect, infecting it, and then, you know, releasing more spores to infect the next insect. Um, well, we've actually been looking into it for many different types of insects. In the beginning, it was termites and carpenter ants. Now we're looking at it for the varroa mite, which is a problem in beehives. Um, but uh, basically, these fungi have been around for a long time. You know, naturalists in the 1800s saw little fuzzy insects and thought, what the heck are these? And look under the microscope, and it's a fungus. Um, so, you know, it's not a brand new thing. Uh, many people have experimented with it over the years and sort of tried to create biocontrols and, you know, products where you can spread the spores out on insects. Uh, I know they're looking into Bouveria bassiana as a fungus that can help prevent like the pine bark beetle and, and other kind of ravaging, insect ravaging diseases that are a big problem um, for us and for foresters. But uh, uh, we've been looking into a fungus called Metarhizium anastopoli. And so there we have a picture of some carpenter ants that are actually feeding on the mycelium. Well, um, the biggest problem is the delivery method. You know, these insects naturally they're aware of these fungi, which are you know, out in nature infecting them, but they don't, they basically sense the spores and not the mycelium. So what we've found is that if you can delay the sporulation, so here you have a culture with no spores, there you have one that's released all its spores. When the spores aren't present, the insects don't sense that there's a problem and so they'll actually feed on the mycelium. And so that's kind of the key that we've been working on. The key component to this technology is coming up with some sort of a bait where it's just the, we call it preconidial stage. So conidia are a type of spore-like structure. It's an asexual spore that can grow into the same mycelium, kind of like molds. They're not reproducing sexually. They're just kind of growing and growing and growing to you know, try and find a place where they can reproduce sexually. But, um, that's where a lot of the patents that Paul has are on is basically the pre-sporulating fungi that you can bait the insects with and then of course the spores are released eventually and, and the insects are controlled. Um, and this is the most common, it's the leaf cutter ant um, on the, with the cordyceps mushroom fruiting out of its head. Um, and then of course the life cycle, so the spores they grow as a mycelium, the canidia land on insects and mummify the insect and then the spores are released from the mushroom again. So, as uh, growers of clean and sterile mycelium, we hate spores. You don't want spores in your lab because they fly over and land on the next petri dish. So when Paul first started experimenting with this metarhizium, as soon as he saw a little clean sector, right, I was talking about sectoring before where it kind of differentiates on the petri dish, he would run with the white sectors, and those were the sectors that delayed sporulation. And over time, he was able to get cultures that would grow completely white and not sporulate for a period of time. And so that's what we've been working on in order to come up with these you know, live biocontrols that can then be used as a bait for certain insects. There we have a carpenter ant that's fully mummified. <laughs> So I'm going to get into our kind of our bee-friendly research, um, which touches on the mycopesticides, but also looks at sort of other fungal solutions for helping the honeybee. Um, and so I'm going to start with a video here. Looks like we've got time for it. So. Um. <laughs> These girls are fantastic. I lift that lid up and those girls are solid across there and they're making honey and they're making babies. Eric Olson owns more colonies than any beekeeper in Washington State. Hot dog. 
There's nothing greater than to open a beehive and see them doing well. They're doing well today. Look at that. I'm really tickled with this. But just months ago, he opened his hives and discovered nearly half his bees were dead. I spent 20 years as a pilot in the Air Force in my share of combat situations, and I never was as low as I was when all those bees were dead. That's the lowest time of my life. It turns out this may be the new normal. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says that nearly half of colonies across the country died in the 2014 season. Big losses have been happening for years, and scientists haven't pinpointed what's causing them. They say more than 60 factors may play a role in collapsing colonies. Factors like pesticides, malnutrition, and loss of habitat. If we don't find some answer, I am really concerned about whether these little girls will survive. But one unlikely solution may be growing close by, in the forests of western Washington. Oh, there's another one. Enter Paul Stamets. He's a pioneer in the study of mushrooms. This is a beautiful specimen. The white margin here means it's growing really well. What I call happy mushrooms. Makes me a happy person too. I'm involved in the study of fungi ever since a very young age. My initial interest was magic mushrooms and then I got into edible mushrooms and medicinal mushrooms and my mother was much happier. <laughs> Stamets scours the forest for rare types of fungi. I use mycology and the use of fungi to help clean up the environment, improve the immune system of animals, and I began to think. We've gone to the moon, we've gone to Mars, and we don't know the way of the bee. All right. You know, I bet you I can do something to help the bees. Stamets recently discovered a mushroom that might be able to take on one of the honeybee's worst enemies. And that's called the Varroa mite, with the, the name Varroa destructor. Varroa mites began wreaking havoc on U.S. beehives in 1996. We lost about half the colonies east of the Mississippi over that winter. Steve Shepard is an entomologist at Washington State University. He spent decades trying to understand how Varroa mites cripple honeybees. He says they invade hives and attach themselves to infant bees. I always think of it as having something about the size of a pancake feeding on you. They live off bee blood and transmit a slew of viruses to their hosts. Some sickly bees lose the ability to fly and gather food for the hive. Many end up dying prematurely. They'll kill the colony within a couple of years unless beekeepers intervene. <laughs> That's why Shepard decided to try a new approach. Uh, something doesn't look quite right with it. Yeah, it'll never fly. He teamed up with Paul Stamets. Stamets told him about a type of fungus that's highly attractive and highly lethal to termites. Shepard wondered what this termite-killing mushroom extract would do to the varroa mite. So we should uh, do something with this, huh? Yeah. Huh? Ready? He recently started testing the product on bees in his lab. So we take bees from colonies with high mite levels. We set up numerous cages, some with fungus. They're finding that the product is killing mites without harming bees. It's certainly uh, it's encouraging so far. And that's not all that mushrooms can do for bees. Bees have immune systems, just like we do and these mushrooms. They're like miniature pharmaceutical factories. Their initial results show that certain forest mushrooms can reduce viruses in bees and help them live longer. I think I've discovered now that the fungi that are rotting the logs are absolutely critical for the immunological health of the bees. This is a really interesting potential breakthrough in understanding how nature works and how we co-evolve with fungi. Shepard and Stamets plan to expand both experiments by partnering with commercial beekeepers. Eric Olson was the first to sign up. I don't have too much hair left. So I have pulled my hair out. We just can't seem to get a control on the Varroa mite. We've got our fingers crossed. 
The future of Western honeybee colonies and the billions of dollars of crops they pollinate may depend on it. All right, so I'm just going to go through. I think we're basically up on time here. Um, but I just have a few real quick slides. So colony collapse disorder is pretty well understood now. Um, way back in the 80s, Paul was growing the garden giant mushroom, and he found the bees were actually sucking on the mycelium. So, you know, fast forward to maybe four or five years ago, he thought, oh, they were probably accessing those myconutrients because they needed it. Um, so we've been looking at different fungi and uh, testing the effect of these extracts on bees. We've been looking at worker bee longevity because a big part of colony collapse is the worker bees just up and leave the hive. Um, and looking at viruses as well because the mites transmit viruses and so if we can help improve the viral burden or reduce the viral burden and increase worker bee longevity it can be helpful for uh, colony survival. So we found that extracts of a couple of different mushrooms increase longevity of worker bees by multiple days even more. Uh, at any rate our preliminary results were statistically significant so we moved forward there's the red belted polypore you can see uh, Basically, they lived quite a bit longer, um, and the viruses were reduced as well. Um, in this case, with the reishi as well as the amadou. Um, and then lastly, of course, we're working with that metarhizium fungus, um, trying to get uh, an effective control and a delivery method that'll work to, to get it into the hives and not negatively affecting the bees. So again, we've done field tests with the metarhizium. We did a massive uh, 532 hive experiment in 2017 with the almond orchard pollination. They were able to take a subset of hives and feed them mycelial extracts. And uh, we actually recently published a paper. Uh, this is just kind of showing how they can incorporate it into the standard bee feed, which is sugar water. So you can just mix in the mycelial extract with the standard bee feed. Um, and we've also been raising a lot of money and donating to WSU. Uh, we've actually raised over three and a half million dollars since 2014 uh, through sales of our host defense products and putting on events, et cetera. Um, and so we're helping them uh, basically come up with a, or develop a new bee research lab. Um, and then just this fall, we published our first paper. So it actually showed that the viruses were reduced. And you'll see here, um, 800 fold reduction um, for Fomus fomentarius, the amadou mushroom. So what can you do? First, of course, just plant pollinator plants. Think of the bee habitat. Encourage natural decomposition because that's such a big part of it is the fungi growing in the rotting logs, which is where bees built their hives naturally, as opposed to these little, you know, houses that we make for them now. Um, of course, you could mess around with the garden giant because that's the one that Paul first saw the bees kind of sucking on the mycelium. Or you could just go straight to WSU and donate or buy our host defense products because a portion of the proceeds go to it. Um, so to recap the whole talk, I really do feel that fungi are environmental stewards in a changing climate. Through all of these reasons that we've talked about today, they can help improve the health of us, the health of our planets, and the many different ecosystems that we depend on and enjoy. So thank you for coming and excellent. <laughs>